asked Mr. Robinson, Pulitzer Prize winning columnist, who he is when he's not busy being a Pulitzer Prize winning columnist. And he said this, he said, I grew up in the South in the late 50s and early 60s at the end of Jim Crow, so I'm an African American who has lived through a period of almost unimaginable change in the country, who had the sort of opportunities that previous generations could never have dreamed of, and who tried to open doors for others. Please help me welcome Mr. Eugene Robinson. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow, what, uh, thank you so much, Jared, and, and thank you, Michael, and thank you uh, to Iowa State and all of Iowa, actually, um, uh, for the wonderful weather today. Um, I know you arranged it just for me. Uh, it was, uh, I always actually um, credit Iowa for the fact that the Pulitzer board lost its mind and gave me a Pulitzer Prize. I, I would not have won a Pulitzer Prize without Iowa, um, and also my wife. And here's what happened. It was the end of 2007, um, <coughs> around the holidays, and like everybody in Washington, I was obsessing and talking about, you know, Hillary, Barack, you know, does he have a chance? The Clinton machine's gonna roll over him. They're gonna, you know, the caucuses are only a few days away, and my wife got sick of hearing this, and she just said, "Get out of this house and go to Iowa. Why, don't, you know, go there." Um, and you know, because you talk about it all the time. When's the last time you were in Iowa? Go to Iowa. So, um, so I, I had no plans to. I hadn't really planned to cover the caucuses that that. Um, that year, I had no hotel room or anything. I found one in Cedar Rapids and found a rental car and uh, it was like a minivan or something, and and uh, and just flew to to Iowa and uh, and started doing what you what you do, going around to campaign rallies. And I went to a John Edwards rally, and it was really pretty exciting. Little did we know at the time um, <laughs> how exciting it was, but <laughs> but. Um, uh, but I said, wow, this is a, you know, he did really well here four years earlier. I, he could, he could um, surprise people. And then I went to a Clinton, a Hillary Clinton rally, and I said, this is really, this is the machine. It's huge. It's professional. It's, it's the Clintons. You know, she's just going to steamroller everybody else. And then I went to an Obama rally, and it was just a whole different kind of thing. Um, I saw a high school gymnasium full of people seemed to elevate uh, about three feet off the wooden floor at, as he reached the climax of his speech in which he said, you know, let's go change the world. Uh, and it, it was electrifying. I'd never seen anything like it. And so I, I went back and I, I wrote, you know, he could actually win um, uh, Iowa and he could actually win this nomination because this is a different thing. And and that, if I had not come and seen that with my own eyes before the caucuses, I don't, I, I, that would, it would not have informed the columns that I wrote during the, during the year. And um, uh, so thank you, Iowa, once again, for the Pulitzer <laughs> Prize. Um, I also deeply appreciate having the evening off from my nightly arguments on MSNBC. I don't. <laughs> I don't have to try to interrupt Chris Matthews. I don't have to. <laughs> I don't even have to get up early in the morning and try to try to um, try to correct Joe Scarborough's history. Um, <coughs> I'm really honored to be here in Ames delivering the Chamberlain lecture. Margie, thank you so much for for what you do. This is a this is a, an honor to me. Um, I wish I came bearing better news, um, but I live in Washington. And so, so we don't have any good news. Um, uh, on Monday morning, it, it felt as if Washington were under siege. Um, I was driving into work. I, I was mentioning earlier, I thought I had my column written, because I have to write on Monday mornings for syndication. And I thought I had a budget column all set in my mind. And I turn on the radio as I'm driving in. and the radio reporters are using a tone of voice that, um, uh, that I don't like. Their voices are way up here, and they're yelling about helicopters and shots fired and the Navy Yard. 
And I'm saying, oh, I don't think that column I'm on the budget is what I'm going to do today. And um, so uh, during the day, we learned that it was indeed um, um, a tragedy was indeed un unfolding at the historic uh, Navy Yard, which has, has been in, in um, southeast Washington for what, more than 200 years. Uh, I believe Abraham Lincoln actually dropped by the Navy Yard uh, earlier in the day before going to Ford's Theater. Um, uh, so that's the, the sort of place um, this institution has had in, in the life of and history of the city of Washington. Uh, and it was, um, and people were being shot dead. Um, uh, during the day, the dimensions of the tragedy took shape and uh, it became clear that it was probably just one gunman. It became fairly clear that this probably was not an act of terrorism. Uh, and it also became clear that it probably was just another of these senseless mass shootings that we're, we seem to be becoming accustomed to. Um, we seem to have resigned ourselves to the fact that this will happen again and again. So. As, as it became clear that this looked like a mass shooting by an unbalanced person, the familiar arguments began to echo around Washington. And so there were calls to revisit the issue of gun control. Um, and the response was an immediate chorus of why bother? Um, because after Aurora, Colorado, after Tucson, Arizona, after Newtown, Connecticut, in which 20 first graders were cut to ribbons by automatic gunfire, polls showed that up to 90% of Americans uh, favored at least background checks. We could all agree on, on background checks for gun purchases at gun shows as well as gun shops. And that seemed to be a reasonable compromise position. Uh, it seemed reasonable to everyone in the country, apparently, you know, gun owners, non-gun owners, city folk, country folk, everybody except the National Rifle Association. Um, and as a result of the National Rifle Association's opposition, uh, a bill for background checks could not even make it through the Senate, to say nothing of the House. Um, so that argument was a relatively quick one. In fact, there were statements from the Senate, um, the, the less dysfunctional of our two houses of Congress, um, saying that really there's no point in bringing up gun control legislation because, or background check legislation, because the votes simply are not there. Um, so quickly, the argument turned to the other side mental health. A lot of people said, who had said all along, we don't need to be talking about gun control, we really should talk about mental health. Um, so, okay, but when we had that conversation about mental health, the people who are saying that's what we should focus on get upset when people like me point out that the biggest expansion of mental health services we have seen in this country in decades is coming through Obamacare. And therefore, if you really believe that the key to preventing these kinds of shootings really is in mental, mental health, then you shouldn't be trying to defund Obamacare. You shouldn't be trying to repeal it. You should be, you know, saying, give us more. Give us more Obamacare. Um, because that's going to, to make mental health services available to 30 million people who didn't have them before. Um, doubtless including some people uh, who, who really need it. Um, but that too was a short conversation. Uh, seemed to last about an afternoon um, and nothing got done. And so that's basically the news that I come bringing from Washington. Nothing's getting done, um, and, uh, and the news gets worse and worse because the prospects for anything getting done seem to get dimmer and dimmer every day. 